The journey to the moon was a monumental act of controlled power. From the immense thrust of the Saturn V to the delicate final hover over the lunar dust. Yet within the structure of the lunar module, the LM, lay a profound engineering paradox. The command service module, which carried the crew through the silent translunar coast, relied on sophisticated, high-capacity hydrogen-oxygen fuel cells. These provided clean electricity and, critically, potable water but they came with a severe weight penalty due to the complex cryogenic storage and plumbing required. For the LM, a vehicle utterly constrained by the singular goal of achieving lunar orbit and touchdown, that mass penalty was unacceptable. Its operational lifetime was measured in mere tens of hours. The solution was a highly specific compromise, the silver-zinc primary battery. This chemistry offered the highest energy to weight ratio available in the 1960s, a critical technical trade-off accepting non-rechargeability in exchange for maximum power density. The LM's electrical system was, therefore, an absolutely vital, highly redundant system based entirely on a finite, non-renewable resource. Today, we examine the precise architecture, the DC buses, the 400 Hz conversion, and the life-saving discipline of load shedding that allowed this limited power supply to successfully execute the highest stakes maneuver in engineering history. When Grumman began work on the lunar module in 1963, the plan was ambitious. The LM was to use hydrogen-oxygen fuel cells, the same elegant technology that powered the command and service module. These compact chemical generators could produce electricity and water at the same time, clean, efficient, and nearly silent. The original specification called for 65 kilowatt hours of stored energy, delivering up to 4 kilowatts for a 35 hour lunar stay. Three fuel cells would feed a redundant electrical system, backed by a small peaking battery and onboard charger. It would have been a marvel of high efficiency design if it had worked. But reality intruded. Fuel cells were temperamental. They required precise temperature and pressure control, complex plumbing and active cooling, all inside a spacecraft already bursting with life support equipment. Testing delays, cost overruns, and the sheer complexity of keeping them operating for short lunar flights forced NASA and Grumman to reconsider. In 1965, Grumman and NASA made the fateful choice, abandon the fuel cells and power the LM entirely with batteries. The decision simplified everything. No cryogenic tanks, no water byproducts, no complicated startup sequences. But it came at a cost, about 100 pounds of extra weight and strict limits on available energy. The LM would now rely on silver-zinc primary batteries. Powerful, reliable, but single use. They could not be recharged in space. Every watt had to be rationed. Engineers redesigned the spacecraft around this new constraint. Every light, pump, heater, and circuit was re-evaluated. The environmental control system switched from AC to brushless DC motors to conserve power, leaving the AC inverters largely oversized but ready for redundancy. The result was a power system that could support a full mission even if one stage, ascent or descent, failed completely. Redundancy became the mantra. Two buses, two inverters, dual feeders, and protection systems guarded every circuit. 
the LM had become a battery-powered moonship, a leap of faith that demanded absolute reliability. At the heart of the lunar module's power system lay four small boxes, the Electrical Control Assemblies, or ECAs. Two were mounted in the descent stage, two in the ascent stage. Their purpose was simple yet vital, to control and protect the spacecraft's batteries. Each ECA monitored voltage, current, and temperature and could automatically trip a circuit if it sensed overload, reverse current, or overheating. If one failed, the other could instantly assume its role. From the ECAs, heavy cables ran to two independent DC buses, one on the commander's side, one on the lunar module pilot side. These buses distributed 28-volt DC power to every subsystem from guidance and communications to heaters and lighting. Through the ECAs, the LM's power was alive, regulated, balanced, and guarded like a heartbeat. In total, the ECAs oversaw seven batteries, five in the descent stage, two in the ascent stage. Each battery was a sealed silver-zinc unit built for high reliability. Descent stage batteries. Five units, 29 volts each, 400 amp-hours capacity, weighing roughly 132 pounds apiece. Ascent stage batteries. Two units, 296 amp-hours, about 124 pounds each. Together, they held roughly 65 kilowatt-hours of energy, the same as an early electric car, but with no way to recharge. The descent stage provided power for all pre-landing operations, from activation through lunar stay. When the time came to leave the moon, explosive bolts severed electrical connections through a deadface assembly ensuring that when the ascent stage lifted away, no live current could arc between the stages. Once separated, the ascent stage batteries came alive, feeding power through their own ECAs and DC buses. The LM's electrical system mirrored the human nervous system. Dual channels, cross-connected, yet capable of isolation when danger threatened. Two main DC buses, the CDR bus and the LMP bus, carried power to all onboard systems. During low demand phases, small 30-amp circuit breakers could be closed to balance the load between them, ensuring even discharge among the batteries. During critical phases, descent and ascent, the buses were isolated, protecting each stage's power integrity. Each bus fed an AC inverter, converting 28 volts DC to 115 volts AC at 400 hertz. Most systems ran on DC, but certain instruments, gyros, radar, and parts of the guidance system required the stable AC signal two identical inverters provided redundancy. Typically, inverter two ran during normal operations. Inverter one was switched in for major engine burns. The simplicity of this architecture was its strength. Minimal parts, maximal reliability. One of the more ingenious designs was the dead face system. Before ascent from the lunar surface, the LM had to completely isolate the ascent and descent electrical circuits. Any stray current at the moment of explosive separation could have been catastrophic. To prevent that, engineers installed dead face relay boxes and relay junction boxes between the stages. 
Moments before liftoff, the relays disconnected, deadheaded and isolated all live lines. When the ascent engine fired, only the ascent stage remained energized, queen, safe, and fully autonomous. These protective circuits were so effective that no electrical anomalies were ever recorded during staging across the Apollo program. Power management on the lunar module followed a precise chronology. Pre-launch, electricity came from the ground support equipment, AC, and the launch umbilical tower, DC. After T-30 minutes, the lunar module switched to its own descent batteries. During translunar coast, power flowed in the opposite direction, from the CSM to the LM through the translunar bus, keeping heaters and lights on while conserving LM batteries. Before lunar descent, both ascent and descent batteries were activated in parallel. During lunar stay, only the descent batteries were used. After liftoff, the ascent stage batteries took over, the descent circuits dead-faced and cut. Every mission followed this ballet of electrons, choreographed down to the second. On April 13, 1970, the Command Module Odyssey suffered a devastating oxygen tank explosion. The CSM's fuel cells, its only real power source, were dead within hours. The crew's survival now depended on the lunar module, Aquarius, which was never designed to support both spacecraft for days on end. Normally, the CSM powered the LM during the coast phase. Now, engineers reversed the flow. Through the translunar negative bus, electricity from Aquarius was fed back into Odyssey. For 83 hours, the LM's seven batteries kept both vehicles live, far beyond any test limits. They operated at an average of just 350 watts, about one-third normal draw, in freezing temperatures around 37 degrees Fahrenheit. Every unnecessary system was shut down. Lights dimmed. Guidance switched off. Even the cabin heaters were silenced to save power. When Aquarius was jettisoned before re-entry, her batteries held barely five hours of energy left, just enough. It was one of the finest examples of electrical endurance and human ingenuity in spaceflight history. After Apollo 13, NASA added an extra lunar battery to later missions, a fifth descent battery that could power either bus in an emergency. This addition, coincidentally already planned for Apollo 15, became a permanent upgrade. The lunar module's power system taught engineers that redundancy and simplicity were more valuable than elegance. Fuel cells were efficient but complex. Batteries were heavy but reliable. In the unforgiving vacuum of space, reliability was life. The LM's architecture, isolated buses, Independent ECAs, conservative design margins, influence spacecraft that followed, from the space shuttle's power control to modern lunar landers. Even today, spacecraft still echo the lunar module's design principles. Keep systems independent, assume failure will happen, and make sure nothing fails in a way that endangers the crew. The lunar module's electrical systems rarely drew headlines. 
There was no drama, no spectacle, just the quiet, steady flow of current that kept astronauts breathing, guided them home, and brought them safely back to Earth. Inside its aluminum walls, power coursed like a heartbeat, invisible yet essential. It was the silent partner of Apollo, the lifeline that never failed. When the last lunar module, Challenger of Apollo 17, left the moon in 1972, its batteries still held a quiet charge, waiting in the darkness. They would never be used again, but for a brief moment in history, they carried humanity's hopes across the void, one electron at a time.